If you like anarchy and libertarianism so much, why don't you move to Somalia? So the answer to that and other burning questions, welcome to Scottish Liberty Podcast number 83 with special guest today. He's back. Uh, it's Keith Preston. From attackthesystem.com. Amen. Today we are talking about examples of real life anarchy, anarchy in action, actual anarchy in practice yes yeah. there have been such things yeah. well anybody who's a regular viewer of this show will know that it's anarchy in action <laughs> all the time there's actually now, a great book um called anarchy in action by colin ward i'd highly recommend that uh there was an english right, okay yeah there was an english um, anarchist writer named colin ward he lived in the latter part of the 20th century who wrote a book called anarchy in action you know, great anarchist work. It provides a lot of practical examples of anarchy in action. It's not just a theoretical work. Wonderful. Right. And we're going to provide some more uh, examples of anarchy in action. Yes, here today. welcome to our five viewers already. So, whoa, six. No. It's going up all the time. Orwell himself, the author of 1984 participated in some kind of anarchist action in Spain, in Catalonia. You can't say Spain, in Catalonia. Um, would you begin by telling us a little bit about what happened in the Spanish Civil War? Well, in the Spanish Civil War, which began in 1936, um, the way the war began was that Spanish, Spain had a, a quote unquote liberal republic. It was a nascent liberal democracy. And there was a coup against the Republic by the military led by uh, General Francisco Franco. And this created a civil war in Spain itself. Now, uh, prior to the development of the civil war, there had been this large anarchist labor movement that developed with, mm -hmm. that had millions of people in it. You had an organization called the, uh, the FI, the Iberian Anarchist Federation. Uh, and then that was the leadership of a much larger group called the, uh, the, National Confederation of Workers, the CNT. And uh, so the anarchists were a large enough movement that they were able to organize their own militias to fight in the Civil War, as well as carry out a revolution in the areas where they tended to be dominant, uh, but which is primarily the Catalonian province and also Aragon to some degree. Uh, so what they actually did was create a social experiment in anarchism where they actually uh, turned the, uh, the factories into worker-run communes and they turned the feudal uh, land plantations into workers' uh, collectives or peasant worker collectives. Okay. And this system uh, functioned uh, fairly well for a period of a little less than a year until it started to become overrun by the other forces that were involved in the, uh, mm. in the Spanish Civil War itself. Um, what is interesting about it is that not only does it uh, provide an example where an organized anarchist movement was actually able to put some of its ideas in practice, but the fact that George Orwell made this experiment famous because of the fact that during this time, George Orwell was fighting in the Spanish Civil War. He was fighting for a group called the POOM, which uh, I forget what that stands for, but uh, I think it's the Marxist Parties of Workers' Unity or something like that, okay. which, was a, which was a Trotskyist group. Um, and uh, Orwell actually you know, was English, but he joined this uh, the Spanish uh, uh, pro-Republican war effort, which people all over the world did. There were radical leftists from all over the world, including from the United States. There was a group called the Abraham Lincoln Brigade from the United States that went to Spain to fight in the Civil War uh, on the pro-Republican side. And uh, when, but Orwell happened to be in Catalonia when this happened, when the uh, anarchists yeah. carried out their revolution. And he wrote about it in a book called uh, Homage to Catalonia, which is still available. And if you read this, you get a, a firsthand account of all the things that were actually going on in Catalonia during the time they were carrying out this interesting social experiment. Uh, and it's, it, it, what's probably the most significant about that is that this was something that occurred in what was a nascent industrial society. I mean, Spain in the 1930s was still, quote unquote, a third world country by, by modern standards. Uh, but they were 
uh, economically and technologically developed to the point that they did have an uh, industrial civilization. You know, they did have uh, factories and they did have automobiles and all of these kinds of things that we associate with modernity. This was not purely a peasant mm -hmm. or a cultural society. Uh, and it's interesting to see how these kinds of systems actually worked. Um, that's not to say that there were there was nothing wrong with this system. I mean, there were this was not some kind of utopia. Um, yeah. There's a there's I mean, an it's article. They seized all all the all the sort of. The, sorry, hang on. A second. All these um, all the factories and farms, so forth that they worked on the collectors. I take it they seized them. They just they didn't. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They, well, they seized them from either the older capitalist owners or from the um, from the feudal land barons. I mean, the agricultural system they had in Spain at the time was largely a feudal model, a traditional European feudal model agricultural system. Uh, and then the uh, industrial system they had was early modern capitalism. It's the kind of capitalism you found in Europe in the 19th century, early 20th century. Uh, so yeah, they, they got control of the, the uh, farms, the plantations and the factories and all of that. And uh, and turn those into worker collectives run by the the okay. CNT, which was this federation of workers' unions. Yeah, right. So we on the we as as I was saying, we are more on the free market anarchy side of the political spectrum. Uh, well, I am. Uh, Tam holds on to his delusions of minarchism. <laughs> I, uh, They're crumbling. But the daily. thing is, we're putting the fun back in market fundamentalists. <laughs> you just wanted to get that joke I did want here. to. And what uh, us market fundamentalists are fond of saying is that without sort of prices, you can't allocate resources efficiently or the uh, people don't... Some people say... Well, the workers don't really know how to run the factories. That's why they're not capitalists. If they did, they'd get loans from the banks and buy them out and so forth. But do you can you say anything about what the economic consequences of the collectivization of farms and factories were? Um, well, it's hard to really tell what the long range yeah. uh, consequences would have been because this experiment only lasted a relatively short period of time. We don't mm, have... Yeah an example of something like this existing in an industrial civilization yeah. for decades. Uh, so that's really the kind of case model we would need to see how well this would work. Yeah, yeah. There is a Because it was basically crushed by the nationalists, yeah? In, in well, the by the nationalists, by, by the Spanish nationalists from one end and by the communists from the other end. So the, right. the, anarchists, okay. the anarchists were in a, in a position in Spain of having to fight a two-front civil war. I mean, we're talking about a civilian you know, popular militia that's fighting a two-front civil war, one of which is backed by fascist Italy and Nazi Germany, one of which is backed by Stalinist Russia, so it was an impossible situation. Yeah. Uh, there is an interesting critique of the Spanish anarchist revolution in Catalonia that's very negative, but it's written by an anarcho-capitalist named uh, uh, Brian Kaplan. Uh, Brian Kaplan oh, yeah, is... I love a, Brian is, Kaplan. Yeah, he's an economist that teaches at George Mason University, which is actually not far from where I live. But uh, uh, but Brian Kaplan has an article, I think it's called The Anarcho-Statists of Spain or something like that, which okay. is a very critical, a critical, very critical examination of the Spanish Revolution from an anarcho-capitalist perspective. I agree with some of Kaplan's criticisms and not others. Um, but what's interesting is if you want to really study the Spanish Revolution from an anarchist perspective and get different takes on it, I'd suggest starting by reading Orwell's first person account of what actually happened mm. there. Okay. There's also a very interesting book that was written back in the 1960s, I believe, by a guy named Sam Dolgoff. Uh, Sam Dolgoff was an elderly anarchist that I actually met uh, back in the 1980s. He was probably in his 90s at the time, but he had actually been in part of the classical anarchist movement in the 20th century in the United States. But he had actually written a book about the uh, the Spanish Revolution and the economic structures and institutions. Uh, I, I believe that was published in the 60s. I read it in the 80s, so it's it's an old book, but it's a very detailed account of the economics of the system. Uh, and then the yeah. Kaplan article is the most thorough critique of the Spanish Revolution, negative critique from an anarchist, albeit mm -hmm. a narco-capitalist perspective. So uh, okay. these these works combined, I think, can give you a really good picture of how this system worked and what was right with it, what was wrong with it, and things like that. Okay. How do you feel about Hemingway? Because every anarchist I've ever spoken to has a real problem with Ernest Hemingway, because apparently, 
they say he 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 made propaganda or he made statements about anarchists in Spain that not even the nationalists came out with. Yeah, well, anarch Hemingway wasn't really much of an um, an ideologue. I mean, it, yeah. it's hard to take seriously his uh, his his statements about anarchists in the Spanish Civil War because he's really writing about something he knows nothing about. You know, he's just yeah. based on a few casual observations. Uh, you know, it's uh, he, he wasn't a student of any of these philosophies and didn't directly participate in some of the activities that we're describing, except on the periphery. So it's yeah, it, you know, it's, it's, in other words, it's nothing worth bothering with one way or the yeah. other. Let me wait other reasons this. Right. Uh, one, while we're on the subject of authors, it's always said that Tolkien was an anarchist, the author of The Lord of the Rings. What kind of anarchist was he? Uh, well, he was um, very interesting because he represents a tradition that is not really frequently form uh, socially uh, formally associated with the anarchist tradition but there's an anarch there's a tradition called anarchism of the right some um some historians of you know intellectual historians have identified this as a tendency among certain thinkers from the 19th and 20th century that uh were op opposed to the rise of modernity they were opposed to the rise of modern mass society mass democracy right. the public administration state but they were not egalitarian leftists like a lot of the social anarchists were, and they were not necessarily libertarians like like the anarcho-capitalist or individualist anarchists. Uh, they tended to be more into what might be called uh, uh, elitist individualism or meritocratic individualism. They had this idea that mass society and mass democracy was pulling down people of superior ability and and uh, uh, things like that. Like they thought that the effect of modernity would be not to raise the masses up, but to bring the superior down to the level of the masses. Mm. So um, the crows were coming in to peck at the eagles, basically. Right, yeah. Um, and Tolkien seems to have been in that particular vein somewhat. I mean, he, he certainly had a quasi libertarian outlook, but he, his thinking seems to have overlapped with that of some other thinkers in this tradition or can, that can be identified with this. Um, Nietzsche is probably, Frederick Nietzsche is probably the most prominent example of this kind of thinking. Uh, Jose Ortega y Gossett, who wrote Revolt of the Masses, is another good example of this. Uh, Tolkien is one. Uh, Tolkien, Tolkien was a Christian, but ironically, uh, Aleister Crowley also fits into this tradition as well, you know, who was uh, an occultist, uh, very anti-Christian. Uh, and uh, there's a number of other things. H.L. Mencken, who was uh, an American writer in the early 20th century, mm, yeah. had, had ideas along these lines. Um, I actually gave a, uh, a, a lecture at the H.L. Mencken Club a few years ago where the, the title, the t I, I didn't title this lecture myself, it was a title given to okay. me by the organization, but uh, it was a tongue-in-cheek title called Anarcho-Fascism. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, a, uh, it's actually an overview of the, the right-wing anarchist traditions, uh, and I discussed some of these ideas a little bit in some detail. That, the, the transcript of that lecture is actually available online. If you just Google my name, Anarcho-Fascism, you'll find this, but you can't take okay. Anarcho-Fascism seriously because it has nothing to do with fascism. But it's, right, okay. Yeah. Are, you, are you a member of the H.L. Mencken Society, or are you just Yeah, yeah, I am. I'm actually on the board of directors, yeah. Wow, yeah. You, you and Paul Gottfried. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Paul, Paul, is the, Paul is the president of the organization. I'm on the board of directors. Wow. Okay. Keith Preston and alt right shocker. <laughs> well, over the it's years, alt right I've, by me. Yeah, I'm, I've over the years I've you know had been associated with all kinds of uh, political groups. You know, I've spoken at conferences of the alt right. You know, one of Richard yeah. Spencer's gatherings. You know, the, the now infamous Richard Spencer before he was famous. Uh, <laughs> and I, I, you know, I've, I speak to the Mencken Club regularly because I'm, again, like I said, I'm on the board of directors. And um, also, um, you know, I've also worked with communists on, on things before, you know, Stalinists and Maoists, usually around anti-war stuff. So it's... Okay. Mm. All sorts of miscreants there. Very... <laughs> He'll work oh, yeah. with anyone. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Okay. Rohab, we've gone straight to Rohab. I we're thought gonna, that's what you wanted to do. No, no, no. We're leaving. We're gonna. We're gonna go where you want to go. We're gonna go where I want to go. Yeah. Well, I want to take a trip down to Somalia. Uh, 
-hmm. where for the longest time, unlike most places, the state law and the common, the, the state was not seen as the law. Somalia, I believe, had uh, their own form of emergent law called the Zir. Before we talk about anarchy in Somalia, not in the UK, as the Sex Pistols once put it, um, <laughs> could you tell us a little bit about the Zir? Yeah, well, all of that is is the uh, just the common law tradition within Somalia. Uh, many societies or cultures around the world have a common law tradition. Uh, obviously, England, you know, out of which classical liberalism grew, but also uh, other societies have their own customary legal traditions. You can find this in a lot of traditional or indigenous societies. And what you're describing was simply the, the Somali version of this, or the, 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 for that region of Africa. Um, okay. What happened, though, was that in the early 90s, when the Somali government collapsed, uh, the um, Somalia was in a position of, well, how are we going to go about organizing ourselves? And you had people that were working to bring this to the forefront and essentially create their own stateless legal infrastructure based on these uh, older common law traditions. Uh, and that still continues to endure. Uh, it's, not, it's not that Somalia, a lot of people get confused about what's going on in Somalia. It's not that Somalia is, a, is some kind of anarchist utopia that has been ever since the government collapsed. I mean, there's all kinds of problems in Somalia, you know, violence, civil war, uh, things like that. But it's also true that you do find pockets of this happening in Somalia where people are creating their own legal infrastructure independently of the state based on these older common law traditions. And these uh, systems do actually work and people do work and maintain these. It, it's a way of uh, settling disputes between groups and individuals and things like that uh, and avoiding things like uh, you know, gunfights and blood feuds and civil war. Yeah. Right. What, what would be, the, what's the, I mean, obviously geographically there's a difference, but are you aware of what's the difference between Somalia and Somaliland? Um, is it the same people or is it two, the two different cultures there? Uh, I don't know a lot about that. Okay. Um, I think they're more or less the, the same region. Um, I think that uh, the Somaliland, it, I think is a region within Somalia. I'm not sure about that. Don't quote me on that because I may be wrong. Sure. But yeah, I only know about it because uh, Liberland, uh, the the new state of Liberland that's been created uh, by Vit Yavlitska, um, they they have some sort of uh, embassy with Somaliland. In fact, they played chess against Somaliland recently and beat Somaliland. Something like take that, yeah, Somaliland. Take that in your Look, face, Somaliland. There, there you go. Yeah. Now you know what system's better. You can't even beat a state of society in chat, even if it's a minarchist one. Yeah, okay. I just wanted to mention because obviously, if you're libertarian minded or you're an anarchist, people say, if you like anarchy so much, why don't you go to Somalia? And I just, my argument for that is that a failed state is not evidence of the efficaciousness or not of anarchism. Like if you saw a ship that was built around a central beam, which they did for a long time, and someone came around and said, oh, I could build a ship that would float, but it wouldn't need a central beam. We'd put ribs around the side and, and the boat would be faster and it would be more efficient. And you wouldn't test that hypothesis by ripping the central beam out of a, uh, existing ship and say well that's synced so obviously you can't do it um but uh article appeared by benjamin powell an economist that i've got great respect for in 2006 called six called somali anarchy is more all orderly than somali government in which powell talks about many of the measures in which somalia improved after the government was done away with so um, people can look that up if they want. What I wanted to mention, because I know a little bit about it, not an awful lot, is that when people know that there's not going to be a state, they make provisions for the there not being a state. They create... As soon as the state moves in and does certain things, it's like, well, there's no point doing that because the government's got it. So that's what I mean. Like, if you burn down the churches, not everyone suddenly becomes an atheist. And um, the... What I understand is that in rural Somalia, because they weren't reliant on the state for doing the things that states normally do, 
things actually went better because there was no taxes on them and that they were not harassed by government officials and so forth when the state collapsed. It's really in the cities where they that they didn't fare so well because they were kind of dependent on the state doing what state for police law and, and other infrastructure. So what I mean to say is that the dependence on state infrastructure creates problems, but telecommunications got a lot better in Somalia because there's no regulation like everywhere else. Um, you, you, you could get a better call and cheaper call in Somalia than anywhere else in Africa, I heard. Uh, there was an increase in life expectancy and things like that. So no one's saying that Somalia is an anarchist utopia, but things like the piracy problems are basically caused by gun control. You know, you're not allowed to... Uh, the, the pirates have got guns, but, um, you know, if you've got a cargo ship or anything like that, you're not really allowed uh, right. to okay. get comparable weapons. So I, I, I know that for a while... Somalia was also under the influence of so-called scientific socialism, and we know how well that tends to work under Siad Bar. So, how I don't know if I've, um, I think that it's basically Islamic fundamentalists messing around in Somalia, and like the the interventions by the UN, the USA, and so forth that are really causing that have really caused the chaos in Somalia. Do you agree or disagree with that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Somalia had a communist government that eventually collapsed into a civil war, which in turn triggered interventions by the United States and by the uh, the United Nations under the banner of the United Nations, but really by the United States. Uh, right. So you had uh, an invasion by a foreign power following the collapse of a communist government, and the, you had the uh, the jihadis trying to establish a foothold there as well. So you have a situation that, ironically, is similar to some other circumstances where a an anarchist influenced or model-like community is developed where, you know, like, like Spain or like Rojava or wherever, we have a civil war and chaos going around, but you have people trying to create their own uh, social infrastructures largely due to the fact that nothing else is available. Uh, and you do see uh, the, from the example of Somalia that, uh, as, as Anthony was saying, that you do find examples of where they were actually able to improve conditions considerably. Uh, yeah. In, in those particular localities. Um, by the way, I just looked up Somaliland, and yeah, I, I was right. It is a, a province, a, an autonomous province within Somalia. Yeah, so they've actually got okay. it as an autonomous region. Um, yeah, but uh, so yeah, when people say, well, if you like, if, if you like anarchism, why don't you go to Somalia? I mean, that's not really a. a, 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 a it's something of a loaded challenge there because it's a, first of all, yeah. people people don't just migrate to another society for politics. I mean, there's also things like, you know, language, culture, family connections, social connections, and all of the, making a living and all of these other kinds of things you have to consider yeah. as a silly. Uh, that's a silly statement when people say things like that. Uh, and, and again, it's not that Somalia is some kind of anarchistic utopia either. It's just that we do find uh, from the example of a state actually collapsing a situation where some people within that particular territory were able to create these infrastructures that were alternatives to the state. So if we do want anarchy and we want to move to it, if not Somalia, what kind of places can we move to that might be of some interest or value or might meet our principles? Mm, uh, that probably would depend on what kind of anarchist you are. Um, there's a, if you're the kind of anarchist that's into communal living and communes and things like that, here in the United States, you actually have communes that are engaged in income sharing projects and things like that. Uh, there's one that's not far from me called Twin Oaks uh, that's part of this larger federation called the Federation of Egalitarian Communities. And this is sort of a model for anarcho-communism. I mean, these, these communities are kind of like what you know, the Kropotkin version of anarcho-communism would look like in practice, I think. I mean, now they still function as part of the wider society. They're not uh, autonomous from the state in the sense that they're exempt from state laws or anything like that. Like they wouldn't be able to farm farm marijuana there without us, you know, or something like that. Um, okay. So they are subject to the to the laws of the state, but so they're not autonomous, but they do function as kind of quasi-anarchistic communes. If that's what you're interested in, uh, if you just want to live what in a- What if you hate the plebs and you're not for egalitarianism? <laughs> uh, well, there's a, uh, let's see. 
there's a if you if, if you're interested in primitivism, if you want to, if you don't mind living in a in a region where there's a, not a not a lot of industry or technology or things like that, the Zamia region of um, the Southeast Asia is interesting. It's, okay. it's part of the uh, it's part of the highland area of Southeast Asia. It's uh, no no state has ever taken root there. This is a region where you have about 20 million people living there. If they're still in pre-industrial uh, status. There, it's a pre-industrial okay. region world uh, but there's about 20 million people there scattered throughout the highlands you know not no industry or modern technology uh, but no state has been able to take root there either in large part because of the geographical terrain and all of that um, so you know that's really the anarcho primitivist pipe dream there uh, or yeah. you know fa fantasy homeland um, you know again you know okay not counting things like language and culture and all of that. Um, if for somebody that's just more of an individualist that wants to uh, live somewhere where the state's going to stay out of their, their face altogether, um, I, there are plenty of enclaves around the world where the state really doesn't really have a whole lot of influence. Uh, Liechtenstein would be one, although they're pretty mm -hmm. tight on immigration. There's a number of European micro states that are like this, that are, exist with a lot of autonomy, where there's not a lot of internal government either. Like Liechtenstein is one, Monaco is one, um, uh, Andorra, the region of Andorra is another. You know, these are all European regions. Yeah. Uh, and for Europeans, that's probably maybe the best state. Now, Lieberland, you mentioned the Lieberland project. It's yeah. interesting. I, I met one of the guys that uh, founded that project yeah. a few years ago when I was in Mexico at an archipelago. Um, right. But uh, there's a, uh, that's an interesting project because they're actually trying to achieve international autonomy and they've had some mm -hmm. problems with the Croatian government and trying to, trying yeah. to get it going, you know, because I think one problem they had was that they went in, they were too bold about what they were doing. You know, they went in with saying, you know, we're going to do this. We're going to be an autonomous. Yeah, onto the flag and all sorts. Yeah, yeah. I, I think if they had done it more under the radar, it would have worked a lot better. Um, the um, Jeff Berwick, who runs the Anarch, uh, Anarchast uh, podcast and who uh, holds, hosts the uh, Anarchapulco gathering every year, uh, he says and uh, Acapulco in Mexico is the best place to be because I've actually been there a bit myself and it is interesting okay. because it's not anarchism I mean you do see cops and soldiers and all of that there uh, but it's it's pretty much hands-off you know like if you're a, if, you're not, if if you're a poor Mexican person who lives in the poor areas of that of, of, of Guevara or the state of Guevara in Mexico or in the city of Acapulco it may be a different story but if you're a Western uh, expatriate it's not a bad place to be it's like a per permanent yeah, tourist yeah. resort basically if you're if you're an american or a, or a european and you're there just as a tourist or whatever or, or an expatriate they pretty much leave you alone you can pretty much do what you want you know it's uh yeah. nobody really cares well, you, you, you could argue if you've got money you could get pretty much left alone anywhere you know <laughs> yeah yeah well uh, yeah, yeah, yeah the, the, when it comes to that yeah I, I i know a lot of uh american expatriates that you know have affluence and, and wealth that have relocated to Mexico and Ecuador and uh, various Latin Puerto America. Rico? Uh, well, right, there's, Puerto Rico is interesting because right now there's a project that the Startup Societies Foundation is working on. Like the Startup Societies Foundation is this group that's interested in exploring some of these uh, startup societies and micro societies that have existed around the uh, current do exist around the world today. Like uh, uh, like the, some of the micro states I was talking about, like Liechtenstein, or like some of the smart cities, like Dubai and Singapore, and like uh, eco villages and uh, seasteads. You know, there's the Seastead Institute's got this idea of creating floating, right. floating anarchic utopias on the oceans or whatever. But the Startup Societies uh, Foundation is an interesting group that's trying to actually, you know, put together the material infrastructure for this. This isn't a group that exists to promote a philosophy as much as actually build these kinds of places. And they've got a project now where they're trying to actually go into Puerto Rico and essentially rebuild Puerto Rico after the hurricane that happened there last year, uh, based right. on some of these ideas, you know, these ideas of creating uh, essentially turning Puerto Rico into one of these kind of startup societies with its own infrastructure and things like that. Now, a problem with that, obviously, is that the Puerto Rico is a colony of the United States, and mm. the Americans are very opposed to the idea of you know people going off and doing their own thing. Obviously, uh, particularly one of their <laughs> how own, ironic. Yeah, yeah, how particularly, ironic. yeah, particularly one of their own. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting how uh, 
uh, you know, our nation, the United States, started as a war of the colonies in, seceding from Britain, and now we pretty much are trying to subjugate the rest of the world. So it's uh, <laughs> yeah, and it's a shame because what a great gift um, America gave to the world in the fact that their constitution was the first document individualist political document that said you've got the right to pursue your own happiness individual before that it's not nothing's individual it's like you know you can't have a uh, separation of church and state because people will go to hell you know you uh, you, you can't uh, you can't just be doing your own thing you've got a duty to um and uh, sadly that legacy has been lost to collectivism so I think, is it not true that these microstates like Monaco are just really for rich people, though? Yeah, well, certainly it's you're better off in one of these places if you are a rich person. Uh, <laughs> that's not. But somebody that's, must. Somebody must take out the garbage, though, right? Yeah, somebody yeah. must. Well, uh, well, a criticism I have of some of the. I don't know as much about Monaco per se. I, th I doubt this is as much of an issue there. But in Dubai is often cited as a model for this microstate, but it's it's actually an oligarchy where the, the people that do the labor, or many of them are migrant workers that are basically serfs and indentured servants. So yeah, the, the, that's an issue there. Um, yeah. But there's a whole lot of uh, small, largely autonomous regions around the world that have managed to maintain a relatively high level of independence from states. Um, there was a book written about 20 years ago called Downsizing the USA, uh, it was written by a, um, an acquaintance of mine named Thomas Naylor, who's now deceased. But uh, what he wanted was for the state of Vermont here in the United States to secede from the United States and become an independent nation, which it once was. It actually was an independent nation before it joined the United States 200 years or so yeah. ago. Um, and he wanted it to go back to being autonomous. Um, but he actually wrote a book about this called Downsizing the USA. And it's a it's kind of a quasi anarchistic book. Tom, though, was more of a communitarian than an anarchist. But um, but uh, he actually goes into a lot of detail in this book describing a lot of these small territories around the world, like Liechtenstein, like Monaco, like Dubai, like Singapore, like various island nations, uh, like uh, various other places, Andorra, whatever, that have managed to achieve a relatively high level of independence, either as independent nations that other nations simply leave alone, or they are yeah. territories that are officially owned or controlled by other countries but the, their parent nation, you know, what for whatever, leaves them alone for whatever reason. Right. You know, like China, Hong Kong is an example, and yeah. Hong Kong is theoretically and part of China, but it's uh, they pretty much do their own thing up to a point. And it's worth mentioning that, you know, Hong Kong and Singapore at a time were as poor as African nations were, but in 30, 40 years managed to establish excellent economic growth and um, take most people in their country out of poverty. So... Would you care? Uh, well, that's. I'm going to move on to that next. I just want to go back a little bit because uh, we missed out on this. I know that you were keen to talk about the Paris Commune, Keith. What was the Paris Commune? Uh, how did that come about and how long did it last? Uh, well, the Paris Commune was a, um, a worker revolt that happened in Paris in the 1870s. And uh, what's interesting is that there was a workers' insurrection where they, it was similar to what happened in Spain later. It was a, yeah. um, a workers' insurrection and they essentially overthrew the government of Paris and they turned it into this kind of uh, quasi-anarchistic uh, collective uh, similar to what happened in, uh, in Spain. Uh, what was interesting though is that a lot of the radical groups from the 19th century that had previously been fighting with each other actually adopted the Paris Commune as their model. Like the anarchists like Bakunin looked at the Paris Commune and said, yeah, that's it, you know, that's, our, that's where we're headed. But ironically, the Marxists did the same thing. Marx and Engels also looked at the Paris Commune and said, yeah, that's where we want to go as well. So it's, uh, okay. so, you know, it's, it's interesting how the left and right and anarchists and socialists and libertarians and all that tend to converge when it comes to some of these kinds of questions. Mm. Okay. Yeah, um, weird convergence. Moving up to modern times, uh, one of the most recent examples uh, not a lot of people know about of a, of a kind of, a, some people say it's not real anarchy, but a, a kind of anarchist uh, coming to be, uh, uh, was it, how do we pronounce it, Rojava? Rojava, Rojava. Yeah, yeah and nah. that's in northern Syria. It's a de facto autonomous zone. It's been able to govern itself separately, apparently, uh, declared autonomy in November 2013. 
it's described as libertarian socialism or uh, libertarian municipalism uh, uh, after the philosopher Murray Bookchin. What can you comment about that, uh, libertarian municipalism and Murray Bookchin? <laughs> Well, the backstory to that is interesting because this is a movement that grew out of the independent, out of the Kurdish independence movement. You know, the Kurds yeah. are an ethnic group in that region that has their historic homeland is carved up into domination by various states, by Iraq and by Syria and by Turkey primarily. And there's this long been a Kurdish independence movement that's been in conflict with the, you know, the Iraqi, the former Iraqi regime of Saddam Hussein, as well as the Assad government of Syria, as well as the, the Turkish government uh, also. Uh, and there's a there was an organization called the PKK, the uh, uh, Kurdistan Workers Party, which is considered a terrorist group by the Western powers, you know, England and America mm. and so forth. Yeah, uh, as is anything that resists, you know, imperialism generally. But, uh, but, uh, but the uh, originally though the PKK was a Marxist-Leninist party. Uh, you know, the standard 20th century model, third world nationalist Marxist-Leninist model. Uh, but the founder, a uh, leader, of this guy of this group called uh, was a guy named Alkalon who uh, became interested in the writings of an American anarchist named Murray Bookchin. Um, I actually met Bookchin once when he was still alive. Uh, this was probably around 1990, 89 or 90. Uh, he was an old old guy by then. Uh, but uh, Bookchin's uh, idea he, he called libertarian municipalism it evolved out of anarchism. Uh, he right, thought right. that the, the he thought that the Western anarchist movement had become too oriented towards lifestyle politics and counterculturalism and things like that. You know, yeah. basically his, his view was anarchism in the Western world, particularly in North America, is, is basically just hippies and punk rockers and vegans and, you know, potheads and all of that kind of stuff. But, uh, but so he wanted to get back more into the idea of uh, anarchism as a, as a political idea or, or a socioeconomic idea. So he came up with this idea of libertarian municipalism, which was kind of like the idea of the self-governed, directly democratic city-state type of institutions modeled on uh, Athenian democracy in ancient Greece. Mm -hmm. And he developed his own model of anarchism that he called uh, uh, communalism uh, and, or, or libertarian municipalism. And ironically, through reading his writings, the PKK started to convert to this kind of philosophy, started moving away from Marxism-Leninism more to a, a Bookchin's point of view. And since the uh, war in Syria has developed, uh, some of the Kurdish uh, independence groups have actually been able to carry out a revolution in Rojava where they actually put some of the stuff that Bookchin developed into practice. They call it democratic confederalism. It's a sort of the idea of a confederation of local communities and things like that that are self-managed. And it's uh, it's pretty much a libertarian socialist model. A lot of left anarchists, you know, anarcho-communists, anarcho-syndicalists have pointed to this saying, yeah, this is a, an interesting model. And some uh, Western anarchists uh, and other leftists have actually gone to uh, Rojava to you know fight in the Kurdish militias against all the groups they're fighting ISIS and oh, others, yeah. um, and and even some anti anti jihadis. I mean, there are even some American uh, Amer um, a military veterans that have actually gone to uh, Rojava right. to, to fight with some of these groups as well. Uh, so it's it's an interesting social experiment that's been carried out. And uh, David Graeber, who was an anarchist writer who has actually been there, he's a well known anarchist scholar. He's an anthropologist who. I think he teaches at the London School of Economics now. He used to teach at Yale, okay. but uh, he, he he's written a, uh, some works on uh, on anarchist theory and, and things like that. He wrote one on the history of debt, which is interesting. But uh, Graeber's actually been there uh, and written about you know, some of the things that are going on in Rojava, which are interesting. Okay, and Bookchin, I, I, interestingly, he was from Vermont as well. You were just you were mentioning Vermont. Yeah, yeah, yeah. he was. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, he modeled a lot of his ideas on the New England tradition of town meetings and things like that as right. well. Well, I mean, I'm reminded of Oscar Wilde's quote, the problem with socialism is it would take too many evenings. <laughs> of course, what was intended by him, socialism was interchangeable with democracy. And I see that town meeting thing as really the problem. Uh, lots of time making meetings and discussing things where uh, too many chiefs, not enough Indians. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, we, we mentioned 
America and America's unique um, tradition and the irony of what um, America has degraded into, which in my opinion is America is too left wing and too right wing at the same time. Yeah. You know, uh, clearly. So, but this was not always the case. And there are some examples of actual anarchy in the United States. That's the Megadeth cover okay. of the, of the, um, of the Sex, Sex Pistols, Pistols song, yeah. Anarchy, anarchy, the USA. anarchy yeah. in the USA. So the Western territories, the wild, the wild, wild West was not <laughs> actually that wild as it so transpires. Is that not true? And can you tell us a little bit about statelessness out in the Western territories? Yeah, um, there's some interesting work that's been done on that as well. There's some scholarly work that has been done on uh, the, the American territories in the Old West or some of the pioneer settlements in the Old West in the 19th century. Uh, there's a fellow yeah. named Harry Anderson that's written about this a bit. Uh, and there's some of the anarcho-capitalists have argued that what actually happened in the Old West was anarcho-capitalism in many ways because you had a situation where people were migrating westward and forming all of these settlements. And this was uh, uh, a wide open frontier. Uh, you had the native peoples, the indigenous uh, Native American nations there uh, who often came into serious conflict with the pioneers. Yeah. Uh, but you also had the, uh, although one, uh, as an aside, studying Native American traditions is really important if you're interested in how anarchistic yeah. or quasi anarchistic societies actually work because the Native Americans tend, were a very decentralized uh, civilization that had uh, many, many, many nations and many, many autonomous tribes and tended to have a very uh, confederal type of infrastructure and things like that. So that's something else that's worth looking at. But um, with these pioneer uh, communities that would that ventured into the Old West in the 19th century, you had a situation where these places were going and being established. They were not necessarily under the protection of the American government because the American government had limited resources with which to protect them. Uh, uh, you know, this, this was the 19th century, with 19th century levels of technology. So um, more or less, a lot of these pioneer communities, these old Western towns and settlements had to uh, essentially become self-governing. And they, you know, you're, so you're dealing with a situation where prospectors and pioneers and miners and uh, adventurers are going out and starting their own towns and their own communities, but they don't really have a government. So they pretty much have to manage themselves and deal, come up with ideas about how they're going to deal with crime or how they're going to deal with attacks, uh, you know, or war with either the Native American communities or with other pioneer communities, or yeah, whatever. Yeah. Those things happened. Um, but so you did have this kind of uh, infrastructure that was created in some of these places similar to what anarcho-capitalist envisioned, uh, envisioned with private courts and private militias and private mm -hmm. police and, and, and things like that. Uh, now, that's not to say there were never any abuses and things like that, but the, yeah, common, the common image that many people have of the quote-unquote Old West is one where everybody's just going around shooting everybody else because they're always fighting over, you know, whiskey and women and money. Being jumping, um, yeah cattle rustling and and yeah. or if somebody if somebody does something wrong a mob of people just go out and hang them you know uh, vigilante style things like that happen um, but it, it's also true that there was a lot more organization to these kinds mm. of communities than what is commonly thought um, you know yeah. you had for example vigilance committees which were or organizations that were created to maintain peace when you had problems with bandits and stuff like that. And if they captured a bandit, they didn't necessarily just hang the bandit. They would actually have trials, you know, uh, with a, a justice of the peace, you know, a person who's appointed mm -hmm. to preside over the trial and, or someone that, you know, people that are experienced with law or something like that would be brought mm -hmm. in to service the equivalent of court officers. So it's not it, it, the picture that many people have of the old West as being this place where there's nothing but chaos going on and constant well, gun battles. Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess they had to sell dime store novels and like yeah. you know, it's a peace and prosperity it doesn't really yeah. sell the dime store novel. You know? Yeah, but well, not only, not only that, not only does it you know, you know, most most fictionalized history is just that fiction. I mean, and they always take the most bizarre and or outrageous uh, aspects of a particular uh, situation and make that out to be the norm. Um, you know, for example, uh, you know, if you, if everybody, 
there are people who think that everybody who lived in medieval England was constantly engaging in jousts and, you know, battles, battles for the castle and, you know, that kind of stuff. No, you know, most people were just trying to get food and, and bread, you know, it's, uh, but uh, it's also true, though, that institutions, the state and institutions that are related to the state have obviously a vested interest in portraying stateless societies in the most negative way they possibly can. You know, you're never going to have institutions that are organized and funded by the American government, the public school system, the university system, uh, coming out and saying, yeah, the old West was wonderful. They they abolished government and wow, it worked fine. You know, that, I mean, yeah. no, no, no state oriented institution is ever going to say something like that. Yeah, um, I believe the murder rates were lower actually out there. And what? The murder, the murder rates. rates were lower out there. I didn't. I didn't understand uh, that. The, the murder rates were lower out there. Oh, oh the I murder have. rates were lower. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I. Well, a lot of that though can be accounted for by the fact that the population was sparse. Yeah. Now, in 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 okay. societies where you have a sparse population, obviously you're going to have a smaller number of murders numerically, but the murder rates per capita tend to be smaller because you tend to have more um, interconnected communities that are more homogenous and people are able to find uh, ways of settling disputes that don't involve killing somebody or something like that. Um, a good example is, is just small towns, small towns, small villages where people generally know each other or have some kind of connection to each other uh, and, um, or, and they're able to work out their problems through just uh, negotiation or there are community common community norms that restrain individual behavior you know you don't steal from your neighbor because then everybody's going to hate you and they're not going to want to be your friend and things like that um, yeah. whereas in large heavily populated societies that are tend to be more heterogeneous where not only there's a where people are impersonal because there's so many people you don't know anyone else uh, and also there's there's a lack of commonality in terms of culture and, and social norms then you start to see crime and violence coming along because you know that's just how you do things. You know, it's it, it's easier to get away with that kind of stuff mm -hmm. because you can just kind of blend into the crowd. Right. And then and then as far as settling disputes, there's not as many ways of settling disputes unless except going to the state directly. Uh, if you don't want to do that, then there's you know there's gunfights and that kind of stuff. You know, particularly people that are involved in trades that are trying being suppressed by the state. Uh, the, you know the drug trade and, and things like that is a good example. Mm. Well, I mean, what people really want to know is in the Western territories, who built the roads? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, they didn't really have much need for roads back then. I mean, they didn't have automobiles. They had uh, they had stagecoaches and traveled right. by horseback. So if you wanted a road, you just got out, uh, you know, your sickle and your shovel and cleared out the brush and, and made a path, you know. That, yeah. now, they are a technology so advanced that only a government could produce them. So Pennsylvania and Rhode Island had episodes where there was no government or little to no government. Is that not true? Yeah, well, those were religious colonies for the most part. Uh, when the United States or what became the United States, North America, was, was first settled, uh, a lot of the early settlements were either prospectors, that is, people looking for goods they could go back and, and trade in England, or mm -hmm. they were religious colonies, basically religious communities that were trying to escape religious persecution in England or somewhere. Uh, and often they would replicate religious persecution in the colonies, but uh, that's a separate story. Um, the first settlement like that was the Puritans, the pilgrims who uh, established Plymouth Rock in what is now Massachusetts in uh, 1620, I believe it was. Uh, and then you also had other religious communities that would split off from those uh, and go on form their own religious community, or or they would come from elsewhere and, and form another religious community. Pennsylvania was a Quaker colony initially, members of the Quaker sect, which were persecuted everywhere. The Puritans wanted nothing to do with them. The Catholics wanted nothing to do with them. The Anglicans wanted nothing yeah. to do with them. Uh, so they started their own. And they, the, so they had the tradition of no centralized authority anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Quaker religion doesn't really have the clergy in the traditional sense. They uh, like a Quaker, a Quaker religious worship place of worship. They call it a meeting house. You can call it a church. 
And basically when you go in there, you just, you don't really have a, it's not like church where you have the liturgy or it's not even like the Baptists where you have a, just a lecturer or a teacher or something like that. You just kind of sit there and meditate. You know, it's like you just reflect on things. It's, uh, yeah. it's kind of, it's more of a, it's kind of a mystical type of Christianity. Uh, but, but the Pennsylvania was a Quaker colony. Uh, I was, I think the original leader was a guy named William Penn. Rhode Island was founded by a guy named Roger Williams, and uh, that, which was a that was initially a Baptist colony. Uh, and the Baptists again were another group that were actually persecuted by the wider Christian uh, religion because of the fact that the Baptists were one of the first Christian uh, group sects to ever to reject the idea of separation of, of of theocracy. They were one of the first to advocate for separation of church and state. The whole Baptist tradition in, in large part is rooted in this idea of church state separation, as opposed yeah. to the Puritans who were Calvinists and, and 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 the Lutherans and the Anglicans and the Catholics and all that who always said no the church and state should be one. Um, but you did have uh, these uh, religious colonies that were formed in New England and Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, places like that, that were autonomous, uh, quasi-stateless religious communities. Uh, we had uh, places like that even later on. In the 19th century, when the Mormon religion developed in the United States, it originally developed in New York, but they were not well-liked. They were considered heretics, and plus they practiced polygamy, which in the, you know, the, the Protestant Christian culture of the, of the time and even today was considered uh, taboo. So they actually started moving westward and they actually formed a colony in Utah, like what is now the state of Utah in the United States was originally a Mormon homeland, a Mormon colony. Um, and in fact, to, to join the United States, Utah had to write into its constitution a ban on polygamy because of this, because the Mormons were famous for practicing polygamy. And some of them still do until clandestinely. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think there was a lot of uh, military force, I think, used to bring Utah into line with the, the federal government. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, Mormons were actually massacred by the uh, American military. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's interesting how the United States has this interesting history we were talking about earlier, of one hand, having a revolution, a war of independence uh, from Britain, and then establishing a declaration of independence and a constitution that says, you know, everyone has an inalienable right to life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, and then you get the constitution with the, you know, the separation of powers and the Bill of Rights. Yeah. And yet it's always been very, very selectively and narrowly applied. You know, it's uh, yeah. it's it's always been, uh, I mean, and this was true right from the start. I mean, right, one, one of the reasons for the American Revolution was the colonies, the American colonies were trying to expand into the Western territories and seize more and more land from the Native Americans. Uh, and the British government was actually opposed to this. They thought it was too provocative and they didn't have the troops to you know, back up the colonies and they kept telling the colonies don't do this. And, and the colonies were like, well, we're going to do what we want to do. And the British were like, right. well, fine, okay, you need military protection. You pay for it yourself. And if we send troops to protect you, they're going to camp out on your farms and you're going to find a place for them to stay. And, the, and, and that is in part what led to the American Revolution because the British were opposed to the colonial expansion yeah. into the Native American territory. So, is there any is there any truth to I mean I've heard that uh, it may be the Lakota Sioux but it could be another group of, of tribes but they had a constitution very similar to to, to the United States Constitution or is that over I, I don't know about the Lakota I, I know that the yeah. Lakota has a uh, have a movement now called the Lakota Republic where they're okay. actually trying to reestablish uh, uh, some of the older um, reclaim the older territories that were part of the Lakota nation, which is out in the western region of the United States. Now, I think what you're talking about is the Iroquois Confederation. The Iroquois, uh, right, okay. the Iroquois Confederation was a, a group of Native American tribes that lived in the eastern, northern eastern region of, the, uh, of North America, and their political model seems to have been something of an influence on the development of the U.S. constitutional system. Okay. And was it the Iroquois that George Washington eventually sort of used a lot of force against? Or, well, no. well, all of them, all of the Native American. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know how that how familiar the first generation of American revolutionaries, George Washington and those people. I don't know that they would have been that familiar with the Lakota because they're geographically they're located much further to yeah. the west, in this eastern okay. region. But I think probably the Iroquois were more of an influence. Yeah. Okay, well, we're coming 
quickly to the end of our time. Is there something oh, no. that you want to include? Well, I don't know. You could ask about the Christiana uh, thing if you want. So. Sure. Christian, Christiania. There's a, this That's is a Denmark, contemporary yeah. example in Denmark as well. Do we know much about that? <laughs> yeah, it's a, uh, um, it's a place in Denmark, in Copenhagen, uh, where it was a, uh, a facility that was taken over by some radicals, some anarchistic radicals back during the early 70s. And largely, it's been able to maintain its autonomy as sort of a city within a city. I mean, it's, in, it's within the city of Copenhagen itself. But they uh, have a certain degree of autonomy from the city. It's largely self-administered. And it functions as a kind of quasi-anarchistic commune. It's a very countercultural type of place, uh, you know, very hippie-ish and all of that. Uh, uh, and it's certainly a model of how a, a community like this can achieve some degree of autonomy independently of the state, even, even though it's still submerged within a wider state system. And a lot of Right, of okay. This as a model, yeah. Would, would you would, would you regard um, the the Amish? Are they, are, would would you regard them in any way as some sort of model of a or, yeah? Yeah, yeah, because they actually have a, a a situation where they've managed to maintain a lot of autonomy from the American government. You know, they they don't use modern technology. That's part of their religion. Uh, they're very yeah. agricultural. Uh, you know, they, they do compromise on that somewhat. For example, they have a farming, uh, they, they used to have a big contract, uh, farming uh, for agricultural contract with uh, one of the big corporations, Libby's, where they would produce a lot of stuff for Libby's. Uh, they don't serve in the military. They're pacifists, so they actually get a religious exemption for military service, although we don't have conscription in the United States anymore anyway. Yeah. Uh, but when we did, they, would, they were exempt from military service. But, they, yeah, they've managed to carve out these agricultural communities that you know, they're still subject to the laws of the state. I mean, they still can't just break the law, uh, but they manage to function independently of a lot of state services and state um, state institutions in a way that most people don't. Do you think that that can continue for much longer, or do you think the state is going to start maybe making some examples in some of these communities? Uh, well, they will do that for institutions, for communities that get too, that they think are getting too independent. Uh, a good example is uh, we had a, a situation about 25 years ago in the United States where there was a group in Texas in a place called Waco, Texas, and it was yep. a, uh, it was a, uh, a cult-like, you know, very religious community, uh, and they were being accused of engaging in child sexual abuse, which yeah. I think the branch was the branch yeah. Branch Davidians in Waco, Texas. Now, and they were also accused of holding illegal weapons. Now, some of these accusations, in my view, were really trumped up. Not entirely yeah. false, but trumped up in the sense that while it's true that uh, the the in terms of the so-called sexual abuse, basically amounted it amounted to the leader of this group having sex with girls that are underage, you know, not little children, right. but, you know, yeah. you know, it was a 30-year-old. Under, under the statutory yeah, age. Statutory yeah. rape, yeah. You know, a 30-year-old guy just getting it on with a 14-year-old or something like that. Yeah. And then, uh, uh, and also, uh, as far as illegal weapons, apparently the issue was they had the the uh, equipment, the, the converter kits that you can use to convert uh, semi-automatic weapons, which are legal in the United States, to fully automatic weapons, which are not legal. So yeah. in response to these, which are very small accusations, you know, really, I mean, well, I mean, these are, these would leave, under American law, these would be considered crimes. But what they did was the, the United States sent out uh, a group of hundreds of federal agents, federal police, to go out and uh, uh, essentially attack this, uh, this commune, this cultic, this con cult had the from what i gather the people that did inside didn't know what was happening to them you know they just knew they were being attacked so there was a shootout people on yeah. both sides were killed federal agents and uh members of the branch davidians and there was a something like a 60-day standoff between the two mm. groups. and eventually the federal government just rolled over them with tanks and killed yeah. them yeah, it killed a lot of sure kids. Thing. I mean, that, and we, we know now that it was the, it was the feds that set fire to the place, yeah. not the branch division. Wasn't yeah. Madeleine Albright involved in that? Uh, no, she was the Secretary of State at the time. She wouldn't have had okay. much to do with domestic affairs. Who the person you're thinking about is Janet Reno, who was the attorney. Ah, general. yeah. Yeah. yeah, she was attorney general, so she would have had something to do. Sorry, Madeline. Yeah. <laughs> well, Madeline Albright's just as bad as a 
Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I mean, we're we're drawing to a close, but the show that we did with you last time was very thoroughly enjoyed. I got feedback from people on Facebook saying, great show, so glad to have you back. We are hoping to see Keith Preston live, so why don't you plug that before we wrap up for today, your live yeah. appearance in the UK. Where can we see you in the flesh, so to speak, Keith? Um, I'm going to be giving a talk in England um, in, on June 24th. The, a, a group called the National Anarchist Movement uh, is going to be holding a conference uh, in England on, uh, in June 23rd and June 24th. I'm going to be speaking on June 24th, and I'm going to be talking about exactly the kinds of things we've been talking about on this program today. I'm mm -hmm. going to be talking about historic anarchist communities as well as uh, present anarchist communities and plans that are people are developing for anarchist communities or communities that have achieved that will achieve some kind of autonomy from the state or you know all these kinds of things we've been discussing. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, if you're interested in attending the conference, uh, again, just. The Facebook page for the National Anarchist Movement is probably the best place to go. There's a lot of uh, information you can find there about how to register for the conference and, you know, hooking you up as far as the location and things like that. So definitely, definitely worth checking. I mean, I'd recommend the conference even if I wasn't going to be there. It's uh, right. you know, the National Anarchist Movement conference. I spoke uh, at their conference last year in Madrid, which is quite an interesting conference. Okay. okay, great. And uh, we'll hope to get this chance to speak to you again. Much more to cover. Anarchist Ireland, Anarchist Iceland, the Free Territory, Ukraine, Zomia, who knows what else. So Yeah. And we could go on for hours about this, definitely. We yeah, can, absolutely. definitely. And if there's enough demand for it, we no doubt shall. Thank you so much, Keith Preston. Find him at attackthesystem.com. And until next time, be libertarians. Don't be a dick. Or a fanny. <laughs>